Hey, good day, everybody. Um, as Vicky just noticed in the, in chat, uh, we didn't think about the fact that the U.S. changed uh, daylight savings time, and Europe, and I guess the rest of the world didn't. So uh, hopefully we have uh, everybody here uh, as, as many as, as we can. And I guess the people that uh, aren't here will be able to watch it in the, uh, the archives. So again, thanks everybody for being here. And uh, we were actually uh, kind of joking around a little bit and saying that it was the, uh, the topic, uh, the fact that it was insect three, uh, that there were uh, less people that had showed up. But uh, hopefully that's not the case because this is actually a rather interesting subject. Um, so again, uh, my name is Alan Clegg, work for ISC, and we're going to continue. And this is the sixth week of the DNSSEC webinar series. So welcome back. So last week we talked about the INSEC record and the way that the next secure record uh, was, or that, that uh, negatives were proven, was by uh, giving a, an enumeration of all of the things in a zone that do exist. Um, it is basically a linked list of all of the labels in the zone. And in addition, it provides a list of all of the records at a given label. So if you go through a zone and uh, you're using uh, INSEC, if, if you know, whoever you're, if you're looking at the, the zone data of someone that's using INSEC for, uh, uh, for uh, proof of non-existence, um, then you can basically walk through the zone. Uh, you look up any label in the zone, even one that does not exist, you're going to get back something that has, a, that may, that will contain an insect record. And then you're able to use that insect record to walk all the way through the zone. Um, at the bottom of the zone, it will link back to the very top of the zone. And then you basically just walk down to the place that you started. And then for each of the uh, uh, labels that you've now discovered, you use the insect records, the data in the insect record to prove uh, or to be able to provide what all of the label or what all of the types are within that, uh, within that label. So one of the, uh, so, you know, that sounds really complicated, uh, but if you use the NL NetLabs uh, utilities, there actually is a uh, program called LDNS-Walk. Uh, and it will actually do this for you. Uh, so it's already coded. Uh, all you have to do is do an LDNS walk and then give it the zone name um, that is insect signed and it will uh, do its thing and provide you with the entire, uh, uh, the entire zone, uh, everything that you've been, everything that you might have thought was secret is now publicly visible. So insect three um, is a fix for that issue. And it is a fix because instead of having the insect three labels uh, or the insect three records at the same label as the data that they are proving either existence or non-existence, these are hashes of the labels in the zone. Um, so this solves the enumeration problem, but what it creates instead, there's no, obviously there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, it creates a computational problem. So when you as a client uh, looks up something that does not exist, what you're going to get back is instead of something in a, with a label that does exist in the zone, you're going to get back a record that is the hash of a label in the zone. And it's going to be a link to whatever the next hash is in the zone, not the next label, but the next hash. So insect three hashes are computed, and then the linked list is created of the hashes, not of the items in the zone file. So no longer do you have a.example.com pointing to b.example.com pointing to c.example.com. You now have the hash of a, which is going to point to the hash of something else in the zone, which may be b, it may be c, it may be something else comply completely and entirely. Um, so again, it is going to give you back two, or, or it's going to give you back a, a set of bookends. It's going to provide you the hashes of the labels that surround the record in question. So to validate the response, the recursive server, whoever is doing the validation, is going to have to do a hash of the thing that it looked up. So if you looked up 
um, demo.example.com and you got back some crazy hash pointing to some other crazy hash, you're going to need to go in, take demo.example.com, hash it, and then see if that hash lies between the two hashes that were returned. And then on top of all of that, you're going to have to check the signature on the MSEC3 record to make sure that it wasn't modified in transit. So you see that there's a lot of computation, not only on the authoritative side, but also on the recursive side. Um, with almost all, of, in fact, with all of the other DNSSEC uh, uh, labels and the, all the other DNSSEC types, the computation is done by the authoritative server when it generates the signatures on the zone and then by the recursive server when it actually does the validation. MSEC3 requires the authoritative servers, both the master server, uh, you know, the primary and all of the secondary servers to do hashing when they return a negative response, either an NX domain or a no data response. So let's look at what one of these things looks like and uh, hopefully that'll make this a little bit more clear. So let me, I'm going to back up and I'm going to back up all the way to, I think, maybe week number one of the series. And one of the statements that I made, and I realized after I made it, in fact, I realized that I made it and I made it in mistake just, just over the last couple of days, I said that NSEC3, that, uh, that other things could appear at a C name, and that could be, you know, a, an NSEC record or an NSEC3 record or a signature. Well, I was wrong. You cannot, you will not have an NSEC3 label at a C name because you're not doing the labels, you're doing hashes of the labels. So again, let me, let me do this and then hopefully that'll make a lot more sense. So what you see in red is the hash of something that is in the zone CLEG.com. We have no idea what actually is the 1C POA you know, whatever that was hashed from, because it's a one-way hash, but we see that there is that hash value dot .com, and there is also a, another label that is the signature on that. So um, we see the, uh, uh, okay, yeah, okay. Um, these are one-way hashes, so when you get this hash, you're not going to be able to figure out, is this www.cleg.com or is this, you know, magical hidden uh, label.cleg.com. We don't know what this is. So you can do testing on these manually um, using a tool from the command line called insect3hash. And uh, you, the man page is online or is, is available to you. And we will uh, we will see this um, again uh, in the debugging section. So the other things that are contained here. So the first thing obviously is the label. Then we have the TTL of 180. We have the, uh, the class, which is IN. We have the type, which is insect three. The first value here is the hash algorithm that was used to turn the label into the hash. Now at this point, there is only one hashing algorithm and that is SHA-1 that is used to create insect three labels. So the insect three, the first value is always gonna be one right now. There may be something in the future that uses a, a different hash algorithm, but right now we're just using one. The next item is a flag field. Um, here there are, it's, it's, you know, it's a 16 bit uh, value. There is a bit here that is the opt out bit. So if you are running a very large zone, which is primarily delegations, so for example, a TLD um, or a second level TLD like co.uk, where almost everything in the zone is an NS record that is a delegation to another server, you can set the opt out bit. And what this is going to do is it is going to exclude any delegation that is unsigned, so that means that there is no DS record that uh, is, is associated with this, with the, uh, the label, 
it's going to exclude it from the chain because you're not going to be able to do validation on it anyway. So it isn't going to matter if there's an insect three record um, or not. This actually reduces the size and the computational time that's needed to create the zone, but it is very specific in that it really only helps when it is a primarily delegation zone. So, you know, unless you're running a TLD or a uh, CCTLD, you know, or a second level TLD, the opt out bit really isn't going to help you significantly. The next item is the number of iterations. And this is the number of times that the hashing algorithm is applied to the label before being published. So, okay, if you take www.cleg.com, and you hash it once, then you're gonna get some value. Well, that's great, but if you can hash it once and get a value, you can hash that value again, or a third time or a fourth time, and you can get um, a quote unquote better, more secret hash value. Well, some of us would disagree with that, but it is one of those things that is able, it is available to you, and in this case, the number is 10. One of the things that is very important to understand about the number of iterations is the fact that when a value is, or when a, when a negative response is being sent to a client, the authoritative server that is generating the response is going to have to run the hashing algorithm that number of times. So if you get, you know, really, you know, grandiose and say, okay, well, let's set this to a thousand, then every time that you respond to a client with an insect three record, so an NX domain or a no data response, your server is going to have to do a thousand iterations of SHA-1 on the label that was looked up before it's going to be able to send a response. So, this isn't one of those things that you really need to uh, set to a large number. There are some sweet spots. Um, I would recommend checking against your own architecture to see, you know, how fast are we able to do insect three hash calculations in or uh, RSA, uh, you know, SHA-1 uh, hash calculations, and then set this number based on that. So again, great, we get to do math. You know, they said there would be no math, but there is math. So if you've been doing work with hashing, or if you've been working with, for example, a, a password database uh, that, uh, you know, you want to be able to store one-way hashes, you know, you don't want to keep customers' uh, passwords around. So instead of keeping the password, you hash the password and you store the hash. Well, there's something that can be done to, to figure out what the values uh, are and that's called a rainbow table. A rainbow table is basically taking all of the combinations within the size of whatever the, the field is that you're, you're uh, you know, trying to, to hash and creating all of the hashes in advance. Then when you see this hash, so for example, one CD POA, blah, 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 you can go to your rainbow table and immediately look that up and find whatever the ha whatever the value was that was used to hash into this value. Well, you know, that used to be something that was absolutely impossible. You know, you didn't, nobody had enough storage, nobody had enough CPU time to create all of those things in advance. Well, now we've got really nice cloud computing uh, facilities that are available. Um, you spin up an elastic, uh, you know, an elastic uh, 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 server, and you know, dedicate you know a couple of hours of CPU to it, and dedicate uh, you know a, a huge amount of disk space, and you can go in and create all of the hashes for a you know for the a DNS space. So to get around that, the next value here is a random hex value that is hashed into the label to prevent the creation. of the ramble. So, so you don't have to have the machine this um, so this is important 
but you know somebody can depending on how long you leave the same salt in place because obviously to make this to be able to check the hash whoever's doing the validation is going to be able to know the salt value so they are going you know you're going to publish this record as you see the insect 3 record contains the salt so once this is done once this is published you can the the bad guy could go out and create a new rainbow table with using this salt and then have all of the uh, given um, uh, labels already hashed so they would be able to go in and figure out what they are. You can change your salt often. I don't recommend it. Um, I am not a firm believer in insect three because I don't necessarily believe that uh, you can't just enumerate the DNS data by walking the entire zone uh, just by brute forcing it. Um, I don't think the DNS data should be, you know, that, that as you're doing lookups, the, uh, the data in your zone is going to be secret. Uh, so I'm not a firm believer in Insect3. Uh, this is going to use a lot of CPU time. Every time you re regenerate with new salt, um, it's going to take a lot of time to transfer the zones from your uh, from your primary to all your secondaries. And then again, it's going to require a lot of calculation when you send those um, NX domain responses or no data responses. And it's going to create, it's going to need CPU time, not only on your authoritative server, but also on the recursive server at the client side. So, you know, again, not necessarily um, something that, that I would recommend, but yes, you can go in and change the salt just be aware that it's going to take a lot of time and CPU time. So the next item here is the lexicographical hashed label, which is next in the zone. So again, this is not the hash of the next label in the zone. It is the next hash value of all of the labels in the zone. So pre, you know, when you're creating the insect three chain, um, the, the server will go through and create the hash of A, it'll create the hash of B, it'll create the hash of C, assuming you have A, B, and C in your zone, obviously. And then it's going to take those values, sort them lexicographically, and create the linked list based on the hashes, not on the labels themselves. So from this, we know that one CDPOA has the next hash at 7v47fg, but we have no idea what either of these actually, uh, you know, what, what they were before they were hashed. So the linked list is sorted by the hashes of the labels and no hash exists between the actual label and this second hash value in the uh, resource record. The next thing here is the resource record types that exist at the label for which the label is the hash. Wow, see why my brain wants to explode when I try to, uh, try to explain this stuff? So if you remember with the NSEC record, you had an NSEC record at, for example, www.example.com. That NSEC record said, oh yeah, by the way, there is an A record, a quad A record, a, an NSEC record, and a signature. But, and by saying that all of those existed, then you know that there is no, for example, HINFO record. Well, NSEC3 has to be able to do the same thing. And so in this case, it says that when you hash whatever you were looking up, it's going to get this value as the label. And there are text rec there's a text record and an RRSIG at that label. Well, how are you ever going to get this response? Well, if I do a lookup of, and I'll go back to the example I gave, w, or, um, yeah, www.example.com, and I looked for an HINFO record. Well, I'm, I may possibly get back something like this, which says, you know, one CDPOA4 has a text and an RRSIG. When I get this back as a recursive server, as a validating client, whether it's a recursive server or the end client, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to take www.example.com. I'm going to add the hash value to it. So in this case, the AABBCC, I'm going to run that through RSA SHA-1 hashing algorithm, 
10 times, which is that number 10, and what I should get out is going to be one CD POA for UF, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, didn't you just give away the fact that www hashes into this value? Well, yeah, but anybody could have done that anyway because you know, while you did a lookup of www, you see that it exists. You can take the salt, you take the www, you glom them together, you run it through SHA-1, and you're going to get the hash. So no additional information has been leaked by providing that hash. And we all we know is that, yes, sure enough, there is another value in the zone. There's another label in the zone of this 7V45 FG whatever, but we have no idea of what it is. And unless we just happen across it, or, you know, it happens to be FTP dot zone or, you know, some other thing that we know would exist, we have no additional information. So this actually works pretty well. So um, actually, let me go back to this. Now you'll notice that there is an RR sig. So there is a signature on that insect record. So as the recursive server or the validating client or you know, whoever's doing the validation, when I get this data, I'm still going to have to go through and find the appropriate key the 40661 in the zone clegg.com. I'm going to have to check that the date that it is right now falls between 2019 1225 and 2019 11, tw or, I'm sorry, 1125 and 1225. Again, expiration date comes first, inception date comes second. I'm going to have to do the, uh, you know, basically do the decryption of this you know, KSVEB thing with that public portion of the key, then I'm going to have to hash the insect record using the TTL of 180 in case I didn't get back 180. And then what I should get back, or when I do that hash, I should match the thing that's here in this signature. Wow. Okay. So insect three layers on top of all of the other calculations, a bunch more calculations. Just be aware of that. Hey, Alan. Query does not match a label in an authoritative zone. And this is just going back over what, I, what I've said. The zone's salt is prepended to the query. So if we look up, you know, does not exist.example.com, we're going to take the salt, we're going to put it in front of that label, we're going to run the hashing algorithm the specified number of times, and then we are going to have to find the label, the hash value, which precedes the thing that we got. Well, actually, we're going to have to find the one that, that it falls between these two, and then we're going to provide that back to the client. So the label surrounding the resulting value and the associated signature is sent as the response. Now, if you thought you were using a lot of CPU just serving a zone, and then you look at your, well, I mean, your CPU utilization isn't going to uh, bump up very much being the authoritative server on a DNSSEC zone, because the only real calculation from the authoritative side, again, prior to NSEC 3, was when the signatures were created. So in this case, you know, the signature isn't, you know, you're not just creating a signature, you know, one time, you're actually having to do this calculation every time you get a negative response or every time you send a negative response, whether it be in X domain or no data. So on the validator side, when you get that insect three response to the query, you have to take your original query, you get the salt out of the insect three response, you add it to the beginning of the query, you hash it with the algorithm that you received from the insect three response, the number of times that were specified in the insect three response. And then you take that value and you make sure that it falls between, lexicographically between the two insect three or the two hash values that you receive back, the label and then the next hashed value field in the insect three record. 
then you have to confirm that the RR SIGs on the insect three response are valid. And when you do that, congratulations, you've now confirmed that whatever was being looked up either doesn't exist or does not have that type at the given label. Okay, I see the looks of confusion. And maybe actually I, I see some light bulbs coming on. I hope it's the light bulbs. Actually, I can't see you at all. Unless your webcam is on, then I might be able to see you, but probably not. So I will wait until the end. I see that there are two questions in the q and I'm gonna ignore them. I actually can't see them at this point. I'm, and I'm waving my arms like, I'm, like you guys can see me. Um, I will take questions at the end. I'm gonna go ahead and finish. We have a couple more uh, record types. The DS record, I've mentioned it when we talked about the validation chain. The DS record is the delegation signer record. It is a resource record used in the DNS key authentication uh, process. And it answers the question, is the zone's public key actually valid? The DS record is stored in the parent zone of the key that you're trying to do the validation on. And it isn't the whole key, it's just a hash of the zone's key. And it's only a hash of the key signing key, not of the zone signing key. Or if you're using a, uh, a, 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 a combined key, then it's gonna be of the, uh, it's gonna be a hash of that combined key. There will be one or more DS records for each DNS key in use in the child zone. We'll see when we start talking about key rollover, why you're going to want to have more than one DS record. It all has to do with taking a key out of your zone and putting another key into the zone without going um, insecure. So you're gonna need to be able to add another key, wait a little bit, take out the key, the older key, and somehow make sure that the DS records always match up between the, that DS record and the parent and the key signing key or the combined key in the child zone. So here's what a DS record looks like. The, uh, of course, the, the label, this is at the label, clegg.com. The TTL is 86261. And I'm gonna guess from this that I looked it up on a recur to a recursive server because I'll tell you, I don't use anything like that as a TTL. We see that it is a class of internet and a type of DS. The first value here in the uh, resource record is the key ID that matches this DS record. So this is going to be the key ID from the child, from clegg.com that matches this following hash. Now, if you look up this DS record, you're actually going to get this response from the com zone, not from clegg.com, but from the parent of the zone in which you're validating the key. So in this case, this DS record is going to be in com, not in clegg.com. The second item here is the algorithm of the key that's being authenticated. And again, if you remember, you know, RSA SHA-512 was algorithm 10. We saw all of the list of algorithms. The key ID, the 39924 in this case, and the number 10 are going to be used to find the key in the child that we're going to do this validation of. The next item here, the number two, is the digest type of this following hash. So here, these are the values or the, the hashing algorithms that were used to create the hash of the key. If you see a number one, it's a SHA-1 hash. If it's a two, it's a SHA-256. I believe that all of the ghost algorithms at this point are deprecated. Um, so I don't think you'll ever see a number three. Uh, SHA-384 is number four, and I'm sure that there will be, and there may possibly already be additional, um, uh, additional values available for you. The next item is the hash of the key identified by the zone and the key ID. So when we go to clegg.com, we look up the resource record DNS key. In the DNS key resource record set, we're gonna get all of the ZSKs, the KSKs, you know, all of the, 
the, the, the, the combined key. You're going to get all of those. We're going to find the one with uh, the, the uh, algorithm 10 that has the key ID 39924. We're going to take that value. We're going to hash it, in this case, with SHA-256. And we're going to compare the value that we've just created with the one that is here in the DS record. And if they're the same, then we know that the child record, that key, is able to be used. We can use that to validate. Now, if this um, zone where we get this DS record from, for example, in this case, Clegg.com, and we're going to get this DS record out of the parent, so com, if that zone is not DNSSEC signed, this DS record is useless for us, and we're not able to do validation. Now, on the other hand, if this record exists in the com zone, then we're going to say that the child zone, the clegg.com, is required to be DNSSEC signed and DNSSEC validatable. So this is the way that we get around the problem of the guy, the man in the middle is trying to, you know, fake our DNS data and they're doing it by ripping out all of the DNSSEC resource records. This record in the parent says it's got to be signed in the child. So you look up Clegg.com DS record from the comm zone, you get back a valid DS record. You then look in the child zone, and if it does not have a DNS key, then you know that you are not able to validate. And in this case, you're actually going to mark the zone as bogus because it's supposed to be DNSX signed because of the DS record. You cannot just rip out the DNSSEC records out of your own zone if you want to take away, if you want to disable DNSSEC because the DS record in the parent also needs to be removed before the clients that are out there are going to be able to say, it's okay, I don't you know, need to do validation on this. Something else to remember, and we're going to talk about this a lot when we talk about uh, key rollovers, is that this DS record is going to be cached for, and on this case, we're going to see for, you know, 86,261 seconds, which is almost 24 hours. If I, as the, you know, the owner of the zone, go in and I rip out all of the DNSSEC records and I rip out the DS record right now, anybody that has that DS record cached already that tries to validate my zone, is going to fail because they see that DS record. It remains in their cache for 86,261 more seconds and you got a problem. So be very careful when you implement DNSSEC that you go out doing all your testing before you put the DS records in. And then when you, if, you, if for whatever reason you ever want to take out DNSSEC, you have to remember that you can't just do it. You have to go in and remove the DS records first, then wait the length of the cache, whatever the TTL is, before you can actually remove the signatures and everything else from your zone. This also puts a little bit of pressure on you because if you botch a key rollover and you don't update the parent DS record, you're going to have a DS record that doesn't match the key signing key in the child, and you're going to run into an issue. So just be aware of that. So um, in this case, again, the label exists in the com zone. So you'll see that the uh, 12163 and com dot, we're looking now at the signature on this DS record. The signature was created with the key 12163 that lives in com. So the person that runs Clegg.com does not have access, probably, to this private portion of the key 12163 in the com zone. And so whoever created this signature is the valid owner of the comm zone because only they should have access to the private portion of the 12163 keying material. So the DS record. 
It's awesome. There are two new resource records that have been introduced, which are child versions of the DS and the DNS key records. What these are going to be used for, and they're, they're I, actually, I don't know of an implementation of these. I, I'm, I apologize. I should know this. Um, but what this is going to do is allow the child zone to pre-publish a DS record or a DNS key that will then be moved up and used in the parent. So if I want to change my DNS key record, what I'll be able to do is I'll be able to pre-generate my DS record that I want to appear in the parent, insert it into my zone as a CDS record. The parent, every once in a while, will go around and, and look in all of its child zones and say, hey, do you have a CDS record? And if you do, then that parent will pull that CDS record up because the CDS record is going to be signed with the keying material from the child zone. It's going to be able to be validated. You know, it's going to have a signature and you're going to be able to follow the chain of trust all the way up. You're going to know that that CDS record or CDNS key record are valid. You know that they're good. You know that they were created by the owner of the child zone and therefore you'll be able to replace those in the parent without having to do a manual you know right now if i update clegg.com i have to generate my ds record or i have to at least notify my you know registrar and then they're going to actually pull my information and then send that new ds record up to the comm zone and now that won't need to be done because these are going to allow the automation of that process. Now, the automation of that process probably will never occur at the TLD level. Uh, because for one thing, I don't think, I don't really want, you know, me as the owner of a zone to be able to make a change to the comm zone. I'll let, you know, I'll let my registrar do that and let them deal with the registry and have, you know, all that done. And in addition, with the number of zones that there are, the, the requirement, you know, for, for the owner of the TLD to go out and do queries against all of the DNSX sign zones and then pull those DS records, those new CDS records up into DS records, it's just, you know, I don't see that um, occurring. Uh, okay, well, that is it for today. Um, it is only 38 minutes after the hour, but I have talked about a lot of really horrific things uh, that, that I hope didn't give you too bad a headache. Um, I will open it up for questions. What, what do we have as far as questions? Oh, you have a lot of questions. <laughs> oh, no, no, not a lot of questions. Okay, go ahead. So um, some, of, some of them are in the Q&A panel and some of them are in the chat. So uh, I seem to have I'm somehow pretend gotten... that I can't see either one of those. Okay, I'll I'll go ahead and read them. So um, the first question, I think this is already answered uh, satisfactorily, but I'm just going to read the question from Jim. Uh, is the entire FQDN hashed? Uh, for example, foo.example.net, or is it just the label, just foo? Um, Okay, wow, you have to ask me a good one right off the bat. And I am going to say that it is the entire uh, FQDN, but remember that it's not just that value, it's also the salt. So the salt is prepended and then the calculation is done. Huh, I thought you said it was just the label when you were talking. Oh, no. Okay. Okay, fine. Hold on, let me look it up. Go ahead, go ahead with the next question while I do my research. No, no, it's okay. I don't want to trip you up here. Um, it's hard to do this. Uh... Oh, no, it's going to be, it's going to be the uh, full um, FQDN because if you think about the top of the zone, um, that's a null label. So for example, clegg.com, the, uh, the SOA record that lives at the top, uh, to be able to create um, the hash of that, 
you're actually going to hash Clegg.com. So yes, it's going to be the full FQDN. Okay. Um, here's another question. I don't understand how, uh, this is from Richard. I don't understand how you can tell whether a hash exists between two other hashes. It doesn't make sense to me how to sequence that. And then, and then Josh gave an example of a lexical sort. And um, there was a follow-up question saying, sorry, I still don't see how sorting hashes corresponds to the sort order of the label sequence in the zone itself. Okay, so I've, I've jumped back here to the, uh, uh, to the, the, the um, NSEC3 uh, value or the NSEC3 uh, slide. So when I do a query, when I do a, a lookup of something that doesn't exist, the authority server will take that value that I asked for. So www.example.com adds, adds the salt and then hashes it. It's then going to look up and find the insect three record that has the hash that I just created that falls between, in this case, the one CD POA and the seven V four five seven. So in this case, my hash might have been six six four three two, blah blah blah. And since six six four three two falls between one CD and seven V four five. And when I get this value back as the client, as the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, validator, I'm going to do the same hash and see that it falls between one CD POE and seven V four five, check the signature. And based on that, I know that this, the answer that I got back is about the question that I asked. And thank you, Bob, for giving us the fact that the signature yeah. uh, includes the FQD and class TTL, uh, everything. Um, right. Is that the insect 3 hash contains it all? Okay. all right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was going to read that. So um, uh, let's see. So here is another question from William. Um, can a lot of bogus requests create a DDoS against the DNS server? Yes. You just hit the biggest problem with insect 3 Absolutely. And it's not just a network issue anymore. It's also a computational issue now. So, you know, those zones that said, oh, it'd be a really great idea to have the number of iterations to be, you know, 99.99. Um, all of a sudden, you're burning your CPU with every time you do a, or every time you get a, a negative response. Okay. Uh, I, I am not going to do a live demo because um, I don't really have it set up in such a way that I can do this. What I might do um, is, so you guys have my email address and you have my, my, my Twitter um, accounts. Give me some ideas on some things that you would want to be done as demos. And I will do that like towards the end as we, as we start running into, you know, some, some, maybe some extra time. Ha ha ha. Um, and I will, um, I will get them. I don't want to say, you know, set up, but I want to actually have some things that, uh, you know, aren't going to be just totally confusing, um, you know, done in advance. Well, the last session is troubleshooting. So that might be a good time to try that. Yeah. Um, so next question from Roberto, how can I get the hash key to configure on the DS record? Uh, there's actually a, um, a DNS key to hash um, uh, to D, uh, D, a DNS key to DS um, uh, application. Uh, it comes with bind. Let me, uh, I'm going to find it real quick. Uh, uh, DNS sec DS from key. So you're going to run that and give it as input the, uh, the key um, or the zone and it'll actually pull the key out and it'll give you back the hash. You're also going to be able to give that um, a flag that says if you want to create the SHA-1, SHA-256, or SHA-384 um, output. Hey, Alan, could you just type the name of that uh, command in the chat? Uh, yeah. Uh, DNS, oops, DNSSEC-DS from key. 
Thank you. Oops, uh, I sent it to all uh, panelists. Let me send it to everybody. Okay, uh, next question. Um, Here's a question from Josh. Uh, so in order to use CDS and CDNS key, I need to manually upload the first set, then subsequently uh, upload a new DS and a new DNS key can happen automatically? We're gonna talk about rolling keys um, in, in gory detail um, in one of, the upcoming, uh, one of the upcoming weeks, and, but yes, uh, basically, what you're going to do before you're able to change your key material, before you're able to delete the existing key, you're going to need to insert a new DS record. So you're going to have a DS record for the old key. You're going to have a DS record for the new key. Once that has propagated completely through, you know, to all anybody that would be doing a lookup for the, the DS records, then you're able to pull out the old key and get rid of it and get rid of all the signatures associated with it because anybody doing a validation now is going to have the new DS record which matches your new key. So, yes. And uh, we have a comment from Anders that that's uh, how it's supposed to work and it uh, seems to be working for him. Yep. Um, for, the so, most, for the most part, it works 100% of the time. Uh, so Jim has come back again and he's saying, okay, so given that the whole FQDN is being hashed, why do you need a salt? Nobody's going to create a rainbow table because unlike for passwords, it'll be different for every domain. So there won't be a hash collision. Well, they're not going to create a rainbow table for the entire DNS. They're going to create a rainbow table for your zone, whoever the, whoever the victim is. So Clegg.com, they're going to create, and, and I, I need to go back. I'm, I know that the signatures cover the entire resource record set uh, and, and the entire resource record. I mean, every, all of the values there. Um, but yeah, I mean, if the more, the more data that's included in the thing being hashed, you know, the, the more little minor modifications can throw off a rainbow table. Uh, but yeah, you're not going to, they're not going to create a rainbow table for the entire DNS. They're only going to create the rainbow table for, you know, www.cleg.com, 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 and, and go from that. Yeah, his point is, uh, because I'll do it on the fly, there's no point in pre-computing it in a rainbow table. And... Um, uh, no, that the, 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 the hashes are not done on the fly. The insect three records themselves are calculated and pre-generated, and they exist in your zone. Oh, I think he's talking about attackers. What attackers? Anyway. Um, I, think, I think that this comment is about, um, you, know, you know, how important this is as a, uh, as a defensive mechanism. Um, uh, let's see. So I think we have a couple more comments that were in, or questions that were in the chat. Um, uh, here's one from uh, Bob. How do we avoid the possibility of a 24 outage if the DS record is mistyped? This makes DNSSEC very dangerous, maybe more dangerous than not using DNSSEC at all. We don't have any control over the TTL at the parent. Right. And that actually is something, you know, I, I think I mentioned it in, in one of the previous, uh, uh, previous webinars that um, I was teaching a class and had someone from a bank uh, in that class and they said, you know, we can take an outage that affects a few people in a random location better than we can deal with an outage that takes out our entire DNS for 24 hours. Now, it's not going, that, that type of thing is not gonna happen if you follow good sanitary procedures because you're not, first of all, you're not gonna be typing a DS record. You're going to be, you know, copying and pasting it, which is much better, your upstream, whoever is inserting that DS record, should be doing validation. It's not going to be just a random, you know, you're just going to insert this thing and they're going to go, okay, well, that's great, let's just insert it. When you do the upload, you know, in whatever manner that is, whether it's, you know, sending an email or whatever, their procedure, your upstream's procedure should be 
is there a matching DNS key and does the hash work? And if not, they should reject the DS record immediately. So the, the initial uh, insertion of the DS record or any, any updates to the DS record should not cause that type of a problem. But yes, it, I mean, DNS in the very early days, we considered it fragile as well because we had these crazy things called NS records. And you know, if you botched up an NS record, your DNS could go away. Well, now we have these things called DS records and we're really scared of them because if you botch them up, your DNS can go away. But we're no longer scared of NS records and we shouldn't be scared of DS records either because we should be doing our due diligence to make sure that we don't accidentally botch them up. Okay, um, uh, I'm not sure that this is really a question, but from Ivan says, uh, when having multiple DSs on the parent, having one fully deployed uh, with the key present on the child seems sufficient for validation. Yes, it is. Um, so when you have a key that is active and you're actually using it to sign your zone, you're going to need to have a matching DS record in the parent. Um, so, you know, to, to do a check of a signature, you're going to, you know, get the, the signature, you're going to see which key was used to create it, you're going to go up to into the zone, find the key, you're going to go up to the parent to find the DS record. It doesn't matter if there's some additional DS records up there that don't match or that, you know, that aren't being used. But again, good cleanliness says that you don't want to have a bunch of, of DS records just hanging out for no apparent reason. Um, you can put keys into a zone that are not being used or you can have keys, you know, for example, with multiple different algorithms, but you only publish the DS record for one of the algorithms, and that's absolutely fine. You can have multiple signatures, you know, from multiple algorithms, but only one of them that's actually used with the DS record in the parent. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's easily done. Okay, I think that's all the questions we have. Um, you know, Jim is still not convinced that having all these uh, hash iterations are going to help a lot, but... Um, Agreed. I agree with him 100%. But it's <laughs> not because of the, uh, the GPUs. It's not because of the ability to hash these things. It's the fact that you're going to be able to create a... Well, yeah, I mean, it is to an extent. It just burns more CPU when you're creating the rainbow table. You're not going to be cracking these hashes. You're not going to be doing the reverse of these hashes on the fly. You have to pre-generate them. And, you know, having a, a salt, changing it every once in a while, you know, burning a bunch of CPU to generate these records. Again, I am not a firm believer in the Insect 3 record. Um, I believe in, you know, the Insect record. I don't believe that, that private secrety data ought to be in the DNS to begin with. So, you know, but that's, that's just me. Yeah, and actually just to emphasize that point you just made, it's something that's come up um, in uh, support. Um, and I think maybe even also on the bind users list, uh, that some people think that they are, um, it's a best practice to change your salt frequently. And uh, we disagree with that pretty strongly that that's, um, more likely to cause problems than it is to uh, really help you out. <clears throat> okay, uh, one operational argument for NSEC oh. is for the opt-out if you have a lot of insecure delegations. That's another comment. Yes, Josh. absolutely, Joshua, you're absolutely correct. And so that is one thing that the NSEC 3, it's, it's not used to, you know, again, to make the stuff secrety. It's the fact that if you have a large number of delegations, but only a few of them are signed, then insect three is only going to create those crazy hash labels for the, uh, for the child zones that are actually DNSX signed. So you're not going to balloon up your, your zone file. So yes, absolutely. Um, but again, that's a really special case. Um, I love being in the presence of people that do run large delegation uh, zones, but that's really not the the, the primary uh, you know the primary customer is uh, that this deploying DNSSEC is 
you know, a much smaller organization without, you know, large, uh, uh, large uh, delegation uh, zones. Okay. Um, that seems to be all the questions for now. Uh, I think everybody's exhausted. Um, so thank you very much, Alan, for another great hour spent with DNSSEC. Yeah, no problem at all. And uh, have a wonderful day, everybody. And remember, wash your hands. <laughs>